How's everybody doing? It's great to see everybody. Uh, this is Austin Christian, our South region. Uh, I don't know about you, but it's just so great to be here at church. Uh, I don't know, you know, the summer has been a lot of movement, has it not? I mean, vacations, going this place, going that place. Uh, we really appreciate everyone's patience. Uh, but uh, we're a church that loves to be together, and uh, we love God's Word, and we love family. And uh, again, we welcome you, and we, we welcome everybody here, and uh, it's just so great to, to dig in God's Word and be together. Uh, if you got an invitation, we're in the middle of a series. We do a lot of series in the church, amen? We try to keep it fun and exciting and keep people connected, and the, the series we're doing is Losing My Religion, and, uh, you know, kind of a, a play on that uh, song from the 90s, but the idea is, is that as a church, we're trying to make it our goal to be spiritual and less religious. And what I mean by that is, is that we have a deep uh, respect and, and obedience to God's word. But at the same time, if you've shared your faith in Austin, you can, you can you know, learn about five minutes that uh, people are really thrown off when, when someone is religious, right? Have you, have you ever shared your faith and someone's like, oh, I can't come because, you know, I'm not religious, you know? And so as, as, as a body of Christ, we, we want to even combat that and say, well, we're not religious in the way of, of just adhering to a religious code or practice to try to earn our salvation. Everything we have comes from faith in, G- in Christ alone, faith in Jesus alone. And, and literally the way that we live our life is in response to what God has already done in our lives. So in many ways, we want to be spiritual and not religious. You know, so again, um, to do that, we're studying out the book of Galatians. And uh, this is an amazing book. If you've never read it, uh, I definitely want to encourage you to read it during your personal quiet times and so on and so forth. Because the book itself is all about breaking free from, from religion. All about breaking free from a code or a regulation and really finding freedom and finding celebration in a new life in Christ. You know, in this book... Paul writes this letter refuting false doctrine that came up from a group of actually Jewish Christians. You know, it's very interesting that the setting of, of, of the book itself, uh, you have a very young church uh, being planted by Paul, probably about, you know, 15, 20 years after the death of Christ. And so you have a church full of Jewish Christians, and then now uh, they're starting to accept Gentile believers, which again, if you know anything about the Old Testament, that's a big no-no, right? Right? We, we never accept the Gentiles in, in really doing anything. They need to be like us and, and, and be separate and, and so on and so forth. But, but things are now different, right? And so what happened was is Paul planted the church, and the church was comprised of, again, Jewish Christians and now these Gentiles. And so when Paul left to go plant some other churches, a group of agitators calling themselves, uh, were, or basically they were known as the Judaizers, said, hey, we, we all know we're Christians, but you know what? If you're a Gentile, you know what you actually need to do to be saved? You actually also need to be circumcised. And, you you know, you also need to adhere to the Old Testament practices. Basically, what they were saying, what they were espousing, was saying that although you had faith in Christ, you needed to do extra things to also be right before the eyes of God. And so Paul is really just, I mean, it's a scathing letter. He's going after them. Because this is false doctrine, and, and really the, the whole gospel is founded on faith in Christ alone. And even before, um, a, again, these Judaizers, they would, they would question Paul's apostleship. They'd even say, who was this guy Paul anyway? Why, is he, you know, why does he think he have, has authority over us? And, and so on and so forth. And so again, that's the setting of the book of Galatians. It's also important to note, at the beginning of this chapter, Paul calls out Peter. Which again, you know, Paul is bold, right? I mean, Peter is the best friend of Christ. I mean, Peter ushered in the coming of the kingdom. Um, he's going to, you know, Jesus said, I'm going to build a church on, on you and, and, and so on and so forth. He has the keys of the kingdom. But Paul called Peter out for, in many ways, being a hypocrite. Because again, the church itself was now Jewish Christians, but also Gentiles. And so the setting was, is that they were uh, having a meal together. And Peter also had recognized this new practice uh, of the Holy Spirit, that, that God was ushering, uh, ushering something new for all Christians. So Peter is eating and talking to Jewish Christians, but also Gentiles. But then the Judaizers, right, they come through. 
or more Jewish Christians who are not yet, uh, you know, they don't have buy-in with this new teaching. And so Peter starts to, you know, move his way a little bit from the Gentiles. And Paul's watching this, and he's like, what are you doing? He's like, he's like you're, you're being a hypocrite. You, you live like a Gentile now, but, but now the Jews show up, and then all of a sudden you want to be away from them? And so literally Paul is really just addressing this false doctrine that Peter was living by. That's the, really the beginning of, of chapter 2. So again, what's Paul's point? The point is, is that all we, you need is faith in Christ Jesus alone. That's the only thing you need to be saved. And again, Paul is saying this as a Jewish man, but he's making it so clear exactly what is it you need to be saved. You know, the title of the sermon this morning is, Out with the Old, In with the New. Amen? Out with the Old, In with the New. That's what we're going to talk about from this passage in Galatians chapter 2. Let's pray, and then we'll open up God's Word. Heavenly Father, God, we're so thankful to be here. God, the singing is just so beautiful to hear. God, the worship, uh, just, the, just the love, the service, God, that, that belongs uh, in the church here, God, is amazing. And we know, God, it is all because of you. God, we pray right now, God, Father, that many of us, God, that you'll open up our hearts, God, as to is there anything that, that we are more connected to in religion than in faith in Christ? And, Father, we pray that we'll lose it. Father, we pray that we'll lose it right now, God, because we know that those type of things can hinder our way to get closer to Jesus. Father, um, be with us, God. Help us to make decisions and be closer to you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Turn over to Galatians chapter 2. We'll read this passage together. Where Paul is really proving that all we need is faith in Christ Jesus. In verse 15, Galatians 2. The Bible says, We who are Jews by birth and not sinful Gentiles know that a person is not justified by the works of the law but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus, that we may be justified by faith in Christ, and not by the works of the law, because by the works of the law no one will be justified. But if in seeking to be justified in Christ, we Jews find ourselves also among the sinners, doesn't that mean that Christ promotes sin? Absolutely not. If I rebuild what I destroyed, then I really would be a lawbreaker. For through the law, I died to the law, so that I might live for God. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live is in the body. I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave him, himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing." So you look at this passage, and, and I know this passage, as in many others, Paul is a master persuader. And he's trying to get the church to really understand what is he saying about faith alone in Christ Jesus and, and not just adhering to, to religion and tradition and the Old Testament practices. He's going to prove his case to focus on Christ and not the Old Testament law. But what does he do? Paul uses words like, we who are Jews by birth, we know. And so he's calling on this group of Christians to remember their conversions. These are a group of Jewish Christians who had converted to Christianity, which again was very, very dangerous at the time. We know in the first century, you could be kicked out of the synagogue, your family could disown you, you could be killed. Many disciples, hundreds of Christians were killed. And yet these men and women had converted to Christianity, but they had started to go back to their old way of life. And so again, as a master persuader, Paul is saying, hey, remember how you, were, you, you, you realized during your conversion that no one, no one can be saved by observing the law. You think about it, and the whole, the whole Testament says the very same thing. You know, you consider the Jewish record, right, where you have Moses, who's such a great man, and did so many great things for God. But sure enough, Moses cannot enter the promised land because of his anger. Even before that, you have Adam, the first man to walk the earth, disobeys God. And then you have David, a man after God's own heart, commits adultery. 
these Jewish Christians understood. They realized, you know what? He's right. No one can be saved by observing the law. No one can do it. We've tried. They've tried. And that there was something about Jesus that the, the, even these Jews, even though it was so dangerous to become a Christian, they realized Jesus is different. This man is different. And that's what had motivated them to become disciples. But at the same time, they had started to revert back to singling themselves out and being separate from the Gentiles, which was completely wrong because Paul's going to prove this in just a moment. But Paul's point is he's really describing, you know what the main problem is? Paul is saying you guys are still fixated on this religious code from the Old Testament and not that of Christ. Verses 17 through 21 go on. And so what he does is he then connects some realities about their Jewish life and their new, and their, uh, excuse me, and their new life as Christians and to really explain this point. One reality he says in verse 17. He says, in seeking to be justified in Christ, it becomes clear that we ourselves are sinners. Again, it's something that they understood. It's something that was connected to their own conversion. And he says that, but if, but if it says that Christ accepts us, again, we are sinners, doesn't that mean that Christ promotes sin? So basically saying that, okay, we know that you can't be saved by observing the law. We all found faith in Christ. And so if Christ accepts us, does that mean that he wants sin? Almost like Romans chapter 6, right? One of the verses says, hey, should we keep on sinning so that grace may increase? Paul's saying, what's going on there? And yet he knew the Jewish audience would understand that absolutely not. It doesn't mean that Christ promotes sin. It means that Christ is so merciful. It means that Christ is forgiving. It means that Christ just displays and gives out grace to every man and every woman who calls on his name. He connects the fact that it's not that Christ promotes sin, it's that Christ loves us. And if he loves us this much, it's not just for the Jews, but it's also for the Gentiles. It is for everybody. Again, a Jewish man or Jewish woman would remember Jesus' life. Whether they walked with him, they saw him, or they heard about him, they knew the type of character that Jesus had. He didn't promote sin. He didn't, he didn't approve of sin, but he didn't care because he loved men and women that much. Again, Paul's making it so clear that the Spirit is, is guiding the church. It's, it's, it's guiding the movement out with the old, in with the new. And so Paul says, okay, in verse 18, so if now everything is made new, then if I rebuild on what was formerly destroyed, being the Old Testament law, then I'm guilty of being a sinner because I'm disobeying Christ's version, I'm sorry, uh, uh, Christ's vision of Jews to be, uh, for Jews to accept Gentiles. So what is he saying in verse 18? He's making it so clear that, all right, if we realize as Jews there's no way to be saved by observing the law, we found faith in Christ, we realize that we are sinners and that he saved us by grace. And again, this grace is not just for us, but it's also for the Gentiles. Then how can we, as, as Christians, now go back to this Old Testament bondage? Jesus died for that. And when he died, he, he really, we're, we're all supposed to die to this Old Testament practice. And with it, with its practices and customs. And literally, if you don't obey Christ in this newness of accepting Gentiles, guess what? You're a lawbreaker. He says, you'd be a lawbreaker. It's not, it's, it's not just Peter not wanting to eat with the Gentiles. No, he's literally disobeying the word of God. It's a big deal. It's a big deal for us to try to figure out just what we want to do instead of where the Spirit is leading us. You know, you look at it, and Paul, uh, you know, the church was going through a very interesting time. 
for hundreds of years, Jewish people were, again, always called to be separate and in many ways to uh, be set apart from those around them. And yet, you study the book of Acts, and it's amazing because everything changes, and everything is new. You have Acts 8, where literally Philip goes and he baptizes an Ethiopian eunuch, okay? He was not Jewish by birth. And then you have in chapter 10, it's a very interesting story where Peter gets a vision to go to a man named Cornelius. And then in that same chapter, Cornelius is is a God-fearing Gentile. He gets a vision to go to Peter. And they all go together, and the Holy Spirit puts it on Peter's heart to baptize Cornelius and his whole family. And so literally, again, it's always been the Jews and only the Jews, but now the doorway to the kingdom of heaven is now open to the Gentiles. Turn over to Acts chapter 10. Sorry, actually Acts Acts 11. You know, here in the verse, Peter has to answer for baptizing a Gentile. Because everyone's like, whoa! The Old Testament says not to do that. What were you doing? But again, it's all about out with the old and with the new. Look at this. Acts 11, verse 1. It says, The apostles and the believers throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized him and said, You went to the house of an uncircumcised man and ate with them? Again, this was something the Old Testament practice said do not do. Starting from the beginning, Peter told them the whole story. I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision. I saw something like a large sheet being let down from heaven by its four corners. And it came down to where I was. I looked into it and saw four-footed animals on the earth, wild beasts, reptiles, and birds. Then I heard a voice telling me, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. I replied, Surely not, Lord. Nothing impure or unclean has ever entered my mouth. Again, because this is what the Old Testament practice said to do. But verse 9, the voice spoke from heaven a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. Out with the old and with the new. Verse 10, this happened to me three times. And then it was all pulled up to heaven again. Right then, there, uh, right then, three men who had been sent to me from Caesarea stopped at the house where I was staying. The Spirit told me to have no hesitation about going, th- going with them. These six brothers also went with me, and we entered the man's house. He told us how he had seen an angel appear in his house and say, Send to Joppa for Simon, who is called Peter. He will bring you a message through which you and all your household will be saved. Again, God's new message is for everyone to be saved, not just the Jews. Verse 15. So as he began to speak, the Holy Spirit came on them as he had come on us at the beginning. Then I remembered what the Lord had said. John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So if God gave them the same gift he gave us who believed in the Lord Jesus, who was I to think that I could stand in God's way? When they heard this, they had no further objections. And praise God, saying, So then, even to Gentiles, God has granted repentance that leads to life. So again, what's the point here? Peter himself had to explain that the Spirit came on me, and it told, him, it told me to baptize a Gentile and his whole family. So again, the Spirit sometimes calls us to get, get rid of the old and in with the new. And so again, for Peter to be a hypocrite in this way was so wrong, because God's new plan was something different. And again, for these Jewish Christians to try to get people back, to, you know, try to Judaize people, to be, you know, have them become Jewish themselves— Christ died for this. Christ died to abolish this Old Old Testament law. And that literally Paul makes the point, once again, that if you choose not to follow this, it's it's just, uh, it's whatever. No, you are literally going against the law of Christ. If you adhere or you, are you, you know, getting back to this strict focus on the Old Testament law. You know, it's interesting, uh, again, studying the book of Acts, 
that this was the, the huge upheaval within the church, is that all these Jewish Christians were now coming into, into the church. What are we going to do with them? They've always been separate. Do they need to be circumcised? And again, it was, it was such a big conflict in the church, a big dichotomy they were trying to figure out. But the amazing part is in Acts 15, the leaders got together. Paul, again, shared about all the Gentile converts. Uh, people shared different stories, probably about the eunuch and Cornelius and his family. And again, the church officially said, you know what? Gentiles do not need to be circumcised. Why? Because again, the only thing that matters is faith in Christ alone. You don't need anything added to that. You just need Jesus. So again, verse 19. He says, For through the law I died to the law so that I might live for God. So Paul says, You guys are so focused on the law, focus on what really matters. That's Jesus Christ in your relationship with him. Verse 20, he says, I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. It's not about what I want. It's not about what I want to do. It's not about my desires. It's about Christ living within me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave him himself for me. And then Paul concludes the letter by saying, if I set aside grace, the grace of Christ that we all experience during conversion, for the Gentiles, for the Jews, then literally Christ died for nothing. So he's basically making the point that if we go back to the Old Testament practices, Christ died for nothing. And wouldn't that hit home, right? Because everyone would think about what happened to Jesus, him being spat upon and rejected and beaten and tortured. Paul knew this would hit their heart. In a nutshell, Paul is calling them to lose their religious practice of the Old Testament law and live with freedom in Christ by accepting the Gentiles as they are as their brothers and sisters in Christ. To die to the law and its practices and live by the law of Christ and accept anyone who had faith in Christ. You know, as we think about this, a couple things I want to put on your heart. What does this mean for our church today? What is the application today for our lives from this passage in Galatians chapter 2? Some things I want you to consider. Number one, if you keep your conversion on your mind, you will always be connected back to Christ. It's very interesting. I love this letter because it reminds me of who Paul is. Paul always reminds people of their conversion. Even in chains, even in prison, Paul is saying, hey, do you want to be converted? Even in the book of Acts, he recounts his own conversion three, four times. And even to persuade the Jews, he says, hey, remember your conversion? Remember how you remembered? You, 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 know, you recognized that you could, not be, you could not be saved by observing the law? That was his doorway to the heart. And I want to ask you, have you forgotten your conversion? Do you remember it? Do you have a picture of it? Do you got something on it? It might be kind of faded away right now or VHS or something like that. Do you remember your conversion? That is the greatest day of your life. That is the day where Christ reigned in your mortal body, where all your sins were forgiven, that nothing the world has could ever have its hold on you. Keep your conversion close to your heart. Never forget it. In many ways, it will always bring you back to Christ. Even when you stray away a bit, your conversion, you'll be reminded to be closer to God. You can't forget your conversion. I want to encourage you, those who are studying the Bible, are you converted? And I really want to hit on something just for a second in the religious world, is that we have tons of people who, are out, who have faith in Christ, but they don't know anything about conversion. And I want to tell you, conversion is something that you remember. Conversion is something that is a point of your life that you know exactly what's going on. No one has made that decision for you. 
It's something that you decide to make between your relationship with God. And I want to encourage all of us, remember your conversion. Remember how you felt. You know, I think for me, again, I love sharing about it. About 15 years ago, Alki Beach up in Seattle, it was really cold. Uh, I know how cold it was. Because, uh, you know, sometimes, you know, you want your parents to baptize you, right? You know, they, they had a great impact in your life. And so I said, hey, mom, do you want to baptize me? And she's like, uh, baby, that's okay, you know. I, I don't really need to get in the water. It was December 31st. It was freezing cold. But I'm so glad. I was scared. I was nervous. I'm like, what am I getting myself into, right? You ever been there? You didn't know what was going to happen. But your conversion grounds you. It reminds you of the things in Christ. Number two, we cannot be saved by observing the law, but through Christ alone. The reality is, is the Old Testament law has value. The Bible has value, but the Bible does not save anybody. Christ does. And you really have to have that on your mind and your heart to understand that. You know, the Old Testament law makes you aware of sin. And it gives you a shadow of Christ coming in the flesh. Consider this verse, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1. The Bible says the law is only a shadow of the things that are coming, not the realities themselves. And again, that's what, the, that's what in many ways these Judaizers and these Jewish Christians had, had gone off on, is that they realized the truth when they became Christians, but they were going back to finding salvation in the Old Testament law instead of finding it in Christ. And once again, the law has value. You know, I think in many ways, it's not Jesus, but it's, it's, it's your map to get to Jesus, right? But you got to keep it in perspective that Jesus is the only one that saves. The law was a written code of God's word. Jesus, Jesus or God's word in the flesh is in Christ. Jesus is the body form and is greater than the written code given by Moses. We are saved by faith in him. And I want to ask you this morning, are you saved because of Christ or because of the way that you live? And I think if we're honest, it's so easy to think, I'm a Christian because of what I do. I'm a Christian because I give a tithe. I'm a Christian because I go to church every Sunday. I'm a Christian, I, I even go to church on Wednesdays. I'm a good Christian. And, and, and so on and so forth. And, and again, this is not to dis, uh, discount these things uh, in many ways, uh, God's word calls us to live this way. But I want to remind us that you do these things because of what already happened with you in Christ. Not so that you can gain salvation, and so that not that you can be saved by some of your own works. Everything you do is in response to what God did for you with the sacrifice of Christ. He's the only one that saved. Not the way that you live a pious, good life. It's just so easy to look at people. I, I know for me, guilty as charged. Sometimes you can look at people in the world and say, ah, they don't read their Bibles. Ah, they don't do this. Ah, they don't do that. Standards on purity, standards on this and that. But as a church, we have to be reminded, we got to be motivated and led by compassion. And understand, and understand that the fact that we're saved it has nothing to do with what we did. It's all about what Christ did. You are saved by Christ and nothing else. Ask yourself, are you more religious or focused on Christ? Another application. Number three, in Christ, we are all brothers and sisters. There's no divisions, no barriers. And we're all, to call, we're all called to love each other as family. Galatians 3, verse 26, it says, so in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith for all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male or female, for you all are one in Christ Jesus. You know, this is so powerful because 
If we're honest, American Christianity is so different today. Because this morning, what's going on right now in so many different venues around America, people are worshiping God, which is amazing, and it's awesome. But let me ask you this. Why is it all white people worshiping together? Why is it all black people worshiping together? Why is it all Mexican people worshiping together? When the Bible says that we're supposed to be one. What is going on with American Christianity? I'll never forget, I was in Spokane, and, um, uh, you know, Spokane, most people just know, it, you know, it's the place where Gonzaga is. You know, Gonzaga is kind of like the famous, you know, um, you know, David and Goliath basketball team. They always do well in the tournament, uh, that type of thing. But most people don't even know where it's at, where, uh, you know, where it's actually located. And so I went on a mission team to Spokane, and Spokane is, is a fairly large city, like 200, 300,000 people in Washington. And um, it was so interesting uh, because Spokane is 90% white and maybe, maybe like 1% black. And I, I'd already left, so I, I, don't, you know, I don't even know, you know what the percentage is now, right? <laughs> so literally, I remember I reached out to a guy outside of a grocery store or something like that. And he's like, he's like oh, man. Man, you know what? I think I'm going to come. I was like, yeah, awesome. He's like, I love me some black church. Ooh, I love it. And it was just so funny because I was like, that's America. He assumed I went to a black church, which there's really no black churches in Spokane, but that's a whole other story. But that's how it is in America. There's, there's barriers even where Christ is preached. There's still barriers. There's still divisions. And yet, in Christ, it's not supposed to be that way. We're supposed to love each other. We're supposed to know each other. Again, my opinion, and I just want to say something real quick for our South group. I want to encourage all of us, get to know one another. These are our brothers and sisters. I know sometimes, if we're honest, we're sitting right behind somebody or before, we don't even know who they are. That is your brother and sister in Christ. Again, everyone's not going to be as close to everyone and all that. That's not even possible but they are your brothers and sisters in Christ. We are called to be family. What is your standard of family in the fellowship? You might say, oh, we don't have enough in common. We don't have anything in common. You got Christ. Isn't that enough? In Christ, we are all brothers and sisters. And Satan's whole goal is to divide the church from within. And you, have to, you go after relationships, you go after loving people and caring and being open with your life, it keeps Satan at bay. You know, I think this is something I'm so grateful for uh, our church here in Austin and, and just, you know, um, you know, the churches we worship with. Again, it, it, it's a boast, honestly, in a good way, that I'm so glad that, that this is what we're trying to go for as a church. And I want to encourage us to continue to have that on our heart, that it, there's no favoritism. There's no all black or white, and and don't think the way the world thinks. Our country is so broken up right now from from racial uh, racial unrest and and, and this and that and and all these things going on. We need to have the church be a haven of hope. That's that's somewhere that's so different than what people see outside, amen? We need to be family. You know, I'm so grateful as well for my friend uh, Richard Kruger. He's a part of our church there in Omaha. And it's amazing how you don't have to have a lot in common with someone to really be close. And uh, he and I have, have actually been calling and texting each other the last 15 years. And uh, it's, it's funny, within the last 15 years, we've seen each other twice. But we've literally, hundreds of calls, hundreds of prayer times, and, and so on and so forth. And he means so much to me in my life. He's helped me in, in so many ways. And, and I, you know, I think in many ways he'd say the same about me. But again, he's from Nebraska. And uh, I love Nebraska. I think Omaha is a nice city, but the rest of Nebraska, it's pretty rough and pretty depressing. I don't know. I'm a city guy. I I love, you know, lights and things like that, but but, uh, Nebraska is Hickville, okay? (laughs) And so I I love my guy Richard, but he lives in Hickville. I mean, he probably rode a tractor before he drove in a car, you know? Like, I mean, we have nothing in common, but we have Christ. Remember that the church is called to be family. A few more as we wrap up. Number four, Christ is all that matters. And it's interesting that it, because if a church focuses on something else besides Jesus Christ, 
the church will fail. The church will fall. You can be sure of that. You know, even Paul combated this in 1 Corinthians 1, because, you know, as you read the chapters, everyone is deciding what preacher they like to hear. It'd be here in Austin, oh, I like Marcus, or I like Christian, or I like Dave, and Paul gets in there, he's like, oh, I'm sorry, uh, who was crucified for you? He's like, I'm sorry. What is he saying? He's saying the only thing that matters is Christ. Why are you guys squabbling over little things? And I think as a church, we need to focus our attention and energy on Jesus Christ. I want to ask you, do you call the name of Jesus Christ in your prayer? Is Jesus a, a living being to you? Or is he a man that's, that's trapped in the Bible? Or is he alive in your life? Christ is all that matters. We all need him in our lives. It's about his character, his love, his compassion. You, we're Christians. Our goal is to be exactly the way, to walk the way that Jesus did, as it talks about in 1 John chapter 2. Christ is the only thing that matters. And then lastly, we need to be open to new things as a church. Because I think the reality is, is that if we're not open to listening to the Spirit, we'll be open, we'll be more open to listening to religion. And you have to ask yourself, where is my faith founded on? In the church, is it about the songs we sing? Are you more fixated on worship than Jesus? You ever heard that? You ever hear somebody say, ah, songs we sing, man, we need more of this. We, and we need more of that. And, and I think in many ways, probably worship, you just need variety, right? You need all types of styles, all coming together to worship God. But sometimes people are so focused on that. How about the way the church operates? How about the way the activities the church does or, or this and that? What if, what if the, the Spirit is ushering in something new? Would you be open to it? Or would you be so fixated on the religion or the religious practices you've been used to as a Christian? See, a church has to be open to new things. Now again, they, they, it needs to be founded on the Word of God. It doesn't need to be heresy. It, it doesn't need to take away from what God's Word says. But the reality is, whatever Jesus says, that's what we do. And that was Paul's whole point. He said, you know, when Christ died, we all died to the old religious code. And so, in many ways, we trust Christ. I'm not the one making this up. Christ is the one. Christ is the one who came upon Peter. Christ is the one who gave him this vision. Christ is the one to usher in these new Gentiles. It's not me, it's Christ. Jesus is the focus we need to be open to new things. Out with the old, in with the new. Lose religion and gain freedom in Christ and acceptance of the Gentiles. And forget seeing the Gentiles as you did in the Old Testament and see them as brothers and sisters. Amen? Out with the old, in with the new.